How's everybody doing? Glad to be back in the room. I actually spoke to the same audience a year ago. Uh, very similar topics, actually. In fact, some of the slides are, that I'm about to show are uh, even the same with slight updates to show what we've done over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, as I always say, I'll try to speed through it. I say that infamously because I almost never accomplish that goal, but I will try to speed through it in order to uh, have some time for, uh, for Q&A. I'll just build this whole slide. Okay, so this is a slide that we did talk about last year. It's only been slightly updated. It's really just an overall vision slide about how we think about our uh, fixed mobile convergence strategy. So uh, at this time last year, we had been talking about, Charter had been talking about launching a mobility service. As of June of this year, we've launched a mobility service. It was a soft launch in June, uh, and really by beginning of this month, beginning of September, it's really a, a full launch in terms of uh, including all of the device portfolio, including uh, the Apple devices. So we're now fully launched. It is a Wi-Fi first MVNO, uh, mobile virtual network operator, using uh, Verizon as the MNO partner. And what a Wi-Fi first MVNO means is, is we use the MVNO as an umbrella coverage layer uh, and then we try to, um, both from a customer experience standpoint and from an MVNO offload standpoint, we try to maximize the amount of traffic uh, we can put onto our own Wi-Fi infrastructure and other Wi-Fi infrastructure. So we always have been a wireless company. Uh, we have support over 280 million devices today on our own Wi-Fi infrastructure. We're actually one of the largest Wi-Fi providers in the world. Uh, just based on that fact alone. What has changed is we've evolved from wireless to mobility, right? So now we're a mobility provider uh, with the Wi-Fi first MVNO. I would say something that uh, differentiates cable uh, from, from our uh, MNO brethren is we have an inside-out strategy, generally, as opposed to an outside-in. And what I mean by that is, you know, 80% of wireless traffic actually takes place indoors, right? Inside the home, inside the office. And so we try to build our infrastructure to recognize that fact. We try to build indoor or inside, and then we opportunistically build or plan to build outdoor to target traffic uh, where it's uh, justified, where there's uh, density of traffic to justify that out outdoor deployment. Uh, we are uh, very interested in CBRS, right, as the, uh, so I said we're going to start off the Wi-Fi first MVNO, that then evolves to a licensed small cell first MVNO. So that doesn't mean we walk away from Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi will always be part of our infrastructure solution, but we'll also add licensed small cells to the mix. Uh, and we're very bullish on CBRS to do that, Citizens Broadband Radio Service. So one of the key advantages we think we have as a cable operator is that we have a deeply distributed wireline infrastructure, and we continue to build that infrastructure out every day uh, to to support our internet growth, to support our video services. So we push fiber deeper, uh, and we have what's called an HFC infrastructure, hybrid fiber coax, uh, to do that. So more fiber uh, over time. And so the natural solution of building out uh, that HFC infrastructure to support our day-to-day -day internet and video and phone business, we can also reuse that exact same wireline infrastructure uh, for small cell placement. And not only does that provide backhaul for that small cell infrastructure, the coax part of the HFC actually powers that radio equipment. So we think that's a tremendous advantage going forward. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. I did talk about this one a little bit last year. I suspect that the rest of the day we will talk about some of these other use cases. I won't spend much time on neutral host or private LTE. I will spend more time, though, on MVNO offload as one primary use case or a mobility use case for small cells, and then that middle layer, rural broadband, um, uh, using point to multipoint. So we're very bullish on this, very similar to what Gordon just talked about with AT&T. Uh, we also have been doing a lot of work, uh, so that was maybe a little different than what I talked about last year. We spent a lot of time uh, over the last year really looking at CBRS uh, for fixed wireless, and I'll talk a little bit more about our plans. Okay, so the first, next set of slides, next two or three slides are, are really more of the mobility trials we've done, and then I'll have a set of slides on the fixed wireless trials, uh, and then I will talk about what we're doing uh, inside the home, uh, really a converged router uh, that includes an LTE Femto based on CBRS. So last year at this time, I talked about uh, the fact that we were just about to launch fairly pervasive mobility-based small cell trials in Tampa and in Charlotte. 
And we have since done that and we've concluded the results from those trials. So we first uh, took CBRS into the lab. That's where we do our you know, SAS integration and EPC coordination and test how it's going to interact with our HSC plant. That was all work we did at the beginning of 17. Uh, back half of 17 is when we really did deploy Tampa and Charlotte, and those were large-scale trials. We had eight separate CBSD vendors, four in Tampa, four in Charlotte, two different virtual EPCs supporting each one of those markets. And we learned a lot about propagation, about mobility, about latency, about handoff between small cells, not so much focused on interoperability, and I would also call the equipment more prototype equipment at the time for Tampa and Charlotte. What we are now doing or planning for and really have been doing for the last six months or so, we're planning more commercial ready trials, sort of the next phase of our CBRS mobility trials. We're actually doing that right here in Los Angeles and also in New York. And so by commercial trials, we've actually evaluated those eight vendors and whittled them down to four, right? And then we've also uh, really have commercial grade equipment where the cable modem and the CBSD small cell is combined in a single box. We didn't really have that type of equipment when we did the trial last year. And so we expect that to be a real world trial. And by that I mean we'll attach uh, on rooftop, we'll attach on strand mount, and we'll also have indoor femtos inside of our SMB, uh, small medium business locations. And so we'll have overlay LTE networks and we really want to see the hand in and hand out between those different small cell form factors. So this is just uh, phase one, what we did in uh, Tampa and Charlotte last year. Again, 400 CBSDs. We really learned a ton. We were very pleased uh, with the results, uh, not just with the CBSD equipment, but work in, we uh, work with Federated Wireless as our SaaS provider. I'm actually on the board of uh, Federated Wireless. So we worked with uh, Federated Wireless uh, very early, uh, not just on SaaS, but also on the ESC. We're still working with them on that. Uh, and then, of course, we work with our uh, EPC vendors to roll out a, a virtual EPC uh, solution to support these trials. Phase two is what I just talked about, uh, New York and LA. Again, a little bit more commercial oriented, meaning we want to test these trials uh, as if that's how we will commercially deploy at scale. That's the goal of these trials and, and what differentiates it uh, from, the, from the Tampa and Charlotte trials. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to fixed wireless. So at the time last year, we certainly thought about fixed wireless, uh, but we really hadn't done enough of the economic modeling uh, to, and also just understand enough about CBRS in terms of its RF propagation performance. This is a totally different use case, of course. So when we talk about small cell for mobility, we uh, tend to think about attaching a cable strand at 18 to 22 feet and at uh, certainly not maximized output uh, transport power uh, because we would create our own interference. For fixed wireless, it's exactly the opposite, right? We're trying to go to very tall towers, as high as we can get, uh, and we're trying to maximize the output power that we're allowed, uh, 50 watt, 47 dBm for, for CBRS, and we do that to maximize the coverage range. So we've actually been doing uh, uh, all of, uh, beginning of, uh, back half of 17 and all of this year, We've gone into individual markets, and they're listed there in the, the step one there, in Denver, in rural Tampa, Coldwater, Michigan, if anyone knows where that is, I'm from Michigan, uh, and then also Bakersfield. So we selected those markets on purpose, and also even different times of year. Coldwater we did in the middle of the winter because we wanted to see how this would perform with snow and ice. So a lot of different characteristics from a clutter and from terrain and from a climate standpoint. So that's how we uh, developed our understanding of what we think the possibilities of CBRS are. We've also done some economic modeling, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Essentially, what we're looking to do is define a 40-mile buffer on the edge of our HFC plant. So charters in 41 states. We already serve uh, not just urban and dense urban and suburban, but many rural customers with, with, with HFC infrastructure. Uh, but we can further extend, again, using a sort of 40-mile buffer on the edge of that HFC plant to offer a fixed wireless service. And we uh, define that as a minimum cell edge speed of 25 by 3, the FCC definition. In some cases, we might go down as far as 10 by 1. Uh, but we're certainly uh, targeting or designing towards a 25 by 3 cell edge for a fixed wireless. And we essentially do that with a 40 mile buffer. And we select that distance uh, because it um, minimizes the transport costs because again, we're using as much of our network as we can, so as soon as it hits the DMARC of the charter network, we really leverage existing infrastructure. 
And then also if you think about it from an OPEX standpoint, our field operations team that already serves uh, our HSE customers in terms of installation and repair issues, it needs to be relatively close geographic proximity to where they are. And so that's why we chose that 40 mile buffer. But just doing that, there is a significant homes pass serviceability estimate, more than we thought uh, when we actually started doing the analysis in terms of where we think we can serve fixed wireless uh, using CBRS. And then I should say, so we've done those trials. We actually did more of a, I wouldn't call it quite a service trial, but, but more of a customer experience trial in Lexington, Kentucky, where in addition to using CBRS, we actually deployed with real, uh, real life services. Uh, we did that with, uh, with their government support. And then from that, uh, we are uh, designing right now a true service trial. And we're gonna pick a county in New York, and we're gonna pick a county in North Carolina. Two of the tougher terrains, by the way, especially upstate New York, uh, but we're doing that on purpose. We wanna see sort of the worst case scenario from a clutter and terrain standpoint, uh, so that we can uh, really gather information about how we can deploy this at scale. And when I say a service trial, what I mean is, you know, not just proof of concept testing, not just one or two buildings, but we'll literally offer the service to paying customers. And it'll go through our customer care team, and it'll go through our field ops team, and it'll truly be a internet service, it just happens to be delivered on fixed wireless. I think this is just a visual graphic. So we, we think about, uh, um, on the left side, for rural fixed wireless, we certainly look at CBRS as a near-term possibility, just like I just described. We also think about lower C-band. I probably won't give too much description of that today. It's not right around the corner, but we do look at lower C-band, which is just adjacent to CBRS between 3.7 and 4.2, as another potential option to uh, add additional capacity to rural broadband over time. We also think about lower C-band for mobility for sure. Uh, I think it's the, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I think it's the true uh, Goldilocks spectrum for 5G mobility. Uh, I do think millimeter wave has uh, some propagation issues that will limit its effectiveness in terms of the true mobility layer. I'm not saying it won't be used, it will, but uh, more for hot spots and really areas of high traffic density. Uh, but I think this mid-band spectrum 3.7 to 4.2 is really the, uh, the right mix of enough bandwidth to be used for 5G and wider channels, 100 megahertz channels, uh, but also better RF propagation than millimeter wave. Then on the right, on the enterprise side, we do look at fixed wireless as well uh, for our commercial enterprise business. So we have HFC infrastructure and most of our enterprise customers are really fiber delivered, but we don't have fiber everywhere, particularly in downtown districts. It's not exactly where cable networks have traditionally been built. And so we continue to build uh, additional fiber every day uh, where that can be cost justified. But in many cases, it's just too expensive to do that. Uh, particularly in urban jungles. Uh, and so uh, we do look at millimeter wave for, uh, for enterprise solutions, uh, one gig symmetric or multi-gig symmetric. Okay, so this is a point I wanna make about fixed wireless and you know, why we've gotten more excited about it. Uh, we have, again, we've deployed and launched uh, mobility service, the Wi-Fi First MVNO. In doing that, we've created an OSS BSS infrastructure that's LTE SIM-based provisioning. So the phones that we sell have to be provisioned and it's SIM-based, it's LTE-based. Well, we can literally leverage all of that OSS BSS infrastructure to initiate a fixed wireless service. That's one aspect that's very uh, encouraging. The Evolved Packet Core, so last year I talked about an RFP that we're running for, for the EPC. We're still doing that, we whittled that down to uh, a subset of vendors. That EPC was originally defined uh, for mobility, still is defined for mobility requirements, but we can use that same EPC for fixed wireless. So we're actually leveraging much of our infrastructure, including uh, all of the transport that already exists at the edge of our HFC network. Truly the incremental cost for fixed wireless is just the transport to the tower and the base station equipment at the tower. And then the CPE is, is uh, you know, you absorb that CP cost only as you get a customer that signs up for the service. And so when you roll all that up, the, the, the cost uh, to roll out a fixed wireless service becomes attractive because you can leverage uh, some of the existing infrastructure that already exists. Okay, so I mentioned inside out. What did I mean by that? So we think about traffic inside uh, and then opportunistically building outdoor. 
So inside the home, uh, we have been doing a lot of work on whether it is a converged router the way this depicts, where it shows Wi-Fi, shows LTE based on CBRS and L uh, Femto and IoT radios all in a single form factor. That's at least a possibility. We're certainly talking to our vendors about exactly that. It could be that we break those apart, that we have separate SKUs, that we have standalone Femtos. Regardless, we're spending a lot of time to think about how we would build out uh, a Femto-based capability, a CBRS Femto-based capability inside the home. You may ask why. Well, as you think about the consumer behavior that has changed as the industry has gone to unlimited models from variable cellular usage models, uh, people don't have the same financial motivation to seek out Wi-Fi like they used to. And that would be a problem for us because if they're not on our Wi-Fi infrastructure, that means they're hitting the MVNO that we're paying for on a per gigabit basis. So it's important to us to make sure that our customers are either on our Wi-Fi or our CBRS Femto, they're on our infrastructure. Right? We can also guarantee a superior connectivity experience by doing it this way. One thing I won't spend that much time on, but we are looking at VPN aggregation solutions, also referenced as multipath TCP, to instead of making an either or decision between Wi-Fi or LTE, we'll actually aggregate them, right? So that's something we're also working on to really improve the connectivity experience. And then I think this is my last slide. Yes, and I know this is CBRS, so maybe nobody wants to see this, but it is, you know, Wi-Fi is important to us. It really is. It's part, uh, it's certainly part of our long-term solution. In fact, one of the the main questions at that U.S. Senate testimony uh, that Dave talked about earlier, there was a lot of questions on rural broadband, and there was also a lot of questions about unlicensed spectrum. And so we are at a crossroads with, with unlicensed spectrum because it's been so successful, right? particularly Wi-Fi. Right? It's truly been the most successful band we've ever had in the FCC in terms of total tonnage of traffic, in terms of its utilization, and in terms of its impact to the economy. Right? And the problem with that success is we're running out of capacity for Wi-Fi. Most people don't think about that. It just, Wi-Fi exists like free air, but it actually is specific frequency bands. There's three bands, 2.4, and an upper and lower in five gigahertz. The 2.4 is completely saturated, and the five gigahertz bands are approaching saturation. So one of the things we really advocate is continued growth in unlicensed space. I don't want to spend that much time, but there's a swath in the 5.9 area, which we think is more immediately available, that doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, but then also the 6 gigahertz band is another area that, uh, that we're definitely interested in. One thing I want to talk about, though, is you know, our aggressive pursuit of the Wi-Fi roadmap. Wi-Fi has an aggressive technology roadmap. Maybe everybody here knows that. But it's, uh, you know, we are the first service provider, uh, in the United States anyway, uh, probably North America, maybe in the world, that have launched 802.11ax, or at least introduced it. And I'll say it this way, we, it's in EFT right now, actually in Los Angeles, it's the trial market, we're also going to go with uh, uh, New York uh, later this year. So it's an uh, EFT, employee field trial, and then it'll go to customer trial, uh, both those markets, uh, before the end of the year. Uh, and then, again, as we look to a converged router where we would um, combine Wi-Fi, potentially LTE, potentially IoT radios, that Wi-Fi service will definitely be based on 802.11ax. It not only improves capacity and coverage, uh, it has OFDMA, actually borrows from LTE, and so it can support many more simultaneous devices than existing Wi-Fi technology can. We also think about... Uh, you know, we talk about millimeter wave, I think most people think 5G licensed millimeter wave, and that certainly will have a role. We also think about unlicensed millimeter wave, 60 gigahertz layer, right? So AD, 802.11 AD and AY, particularly inside the home, is something we spend a lot of time on, both in our labs and as we get into uh, trials with customers, uh, we definitely think that's a solution for us. One of the things, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but one of the things we uh, also work on is our DOCSIS infrastructure uh, uh, developing a solution called low latency DOCSIS. So low latency DOCSIS combined with 60 gigahertz in the home to produce services um, that are in that single digit millisecond latency, right, on a DOCSIS infrastructure. That's not how DOCSIS traditionally works, uh, but that's what we're doing, uh, working with Cable Labs and others uh, to make that happen. I think this is my last slide, and at this point, 
yeah, I am happy to take any questions. Oh, did I take too much time again? Sorry, Dave. Okay. It's not you, it's me. I think I heard some license piece. There was a great op-ed today that um, bipartisan Commissioner O'Reilly, Commissioner Rosenworcel, and then um, Representatives Guthrie and Matsui had a nice op-ed on six gigahertz. So our one question. Oh. Hi, John Boyer from Boingo Wireless. Uh, we've seen companies utilize Passpoint to offload or roam onto partner networks via Wi-Fi. Do you see such a model existing with CBRS, particularly with private LTE networks or public accessible ones? Yes, we were just having this conversation last night. By the uh, way, Charter is huge advocates of Passpoint, of Hotspot 2.0. All of our public Wi-Fi is, we're one of the first actually to deploy it at scale, Hotspot 2.0. We think of it as a solution for many different use cases. One of the problems today with um, device onboarding, any sort of device, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, is the device onboarding, consumer electronic devices in your home, that onboarding experience can be variable at best, and I'm being kind. Uh, we do think that Hotspot 2.0 is a way to potentially authenticate more seamlessly for, for that problem, uh, device onboarding. But certainly, we look at Hotspot 2.0 um, uh, in the CBRS space as well as a way to authenticate. Uh, we, we have a lot of experience in that with our, with our Wi-Fi networks already, our public Wi-Fi networks, uh, and that's one of the things we look at uh, continuously to see the, the best way to do that. Yep. Okay. All right, all set. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. So Appreciate it. Thank you.